that water. Those are all for you. Okay. So the ceiling mics will be on, yeah. or no, or not on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got that up there too. Okay. I'll do whatever you want, but I know we do a standby. I go to Christopher's upstairs for an hour ride. Okay. Thanks. Great. And yeah, so I'll probably I'll probably use the mic when it's time for Q and A. So they'll give me an all clear in just a second when they're ready to start. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to this year's version of the Goodson Lectureship. And I just want to give you a little bit of background on, uh, on why we're here, what the, what the history of the Goodson Lectureship is, and, and also about our speaker. So the Goodson Lectureship was established in memory of Dr. William Goodson, Jr., who was a longtime internist in Kansas City. He was born in 1909, the son of William Goodson Sr., a family physician who practiced in Liberty, Missouri. William Jr. was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Missouri and a 1934 graduate of Harvard Medical School. After service as an intern at the Hartford Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut, he returned to Liberty to practice with his father for a year before traveling to the Mayo Clinic for a three-year fellowship in internal medicine. He then returned to Kansas City, where he practiced general internal medicine and rheumatology from 1940 until his death in 1985. He practiced for his entire career at Trinity Lutheran Hospital, which is no longer in existence. Among other affiliations, he was a UMKC year one docent in the early 80s. For Dr. Goodson, medicine was his true avocation as well as his vocation. Like his father, who practiced until age 82, Dr. Goodson saw no reason to quit, and he saw 10 patients in his office the day before he died. By all accounts, Dr. Goodson was the embodiment of the dedicated master clinician, and at the time of his death, his family, patients, colleagues, and friends established this educational program to perpetuate his spirit of inquiry, discovery, and commitment to patient care. Since 1986, the Goodson Lectureship has brought some of the country's finest internists to Kansas City and we are excited to have Dr. Willarda Edwards join us as this year's Goodson Lecture. Dr. Edwards graduated from the University of Maryland School of Medicine and completed internal medicine residency at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. Upon completing active duty in the Navy, she founded a private practice in internal medicine in East Baltimore, where she is and remains the managing partner. After nearly 25 years of service, she retired from the U.S. Naval Reserves at the rank of commander. 
She has been a giant in organized medicine, holding numerous leadership positions in local, state, and national medical associations, and is past president of the Baltimore City Medical Society, MedCHI, which is Maryland State Medical Society, and the National Medical Association. She's also held senior man management positions at the NAACP and the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. Most prominently, she joined the AMA in 1994 and has served as the chair of the Women Physician Section, the AMA House of Delegate Committee on Compensation of the Officers, and the AMA Council on Constitution and Bylaws. Since 2016, she served on the AMA Board of Trustees and as chair of the AMA Task Force on Health Equity. Her work culminated in the AMA House of Delegates establishing the AMA Center on Health Equity. Hers has been a remarkable career as a clinician and a leader with experiences in organized medicine, legislation, and health policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Willarda Edwards to UMKC. Well, it's truly an honor to be here today. Uh, albeit for some, I think in hybrid mode, I'm not sure if we still have that going on, being projected, but we've also had quite a pandemic of changes in our lives for almost three years now. And I think that nothing is gonna be what they call normal anymore. So normally, uh, change, as they say, is part of life and personally, I think those of us in the medical profession come to deal with it expertly because it is, as they say, what we do. But before I delve into the subject of today's presentation, which is the AMA Center for Health Equity, I wanted to share a little lighthearted look at change. Let's see if I can get this to project. Yeah. Did you know 50 years ago? <laughs> All right. 50 years ago, Hewlett Packard introduced the pocket calculator. Yes, students, we know that's no big deal. But we all have one on our phones now. But it was a big deal back then. And it's the reason why I've learned to use, I, I never learned, rather, to use my big brother's slide rule. I'm sure you guys never knew a thing about a slide rule, right? Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman to seek a major party nomination, announced her candidacy for president. The Equal Rights Amendment, get my projection to, to work here. The Equal Rights Amendment of 1923, aimed at protecting women's rights equally to men, finally became an approved bill by the Senate and the House, and yet today remains unratified by all states. The original home video game, Atari, was introduced in 1972. Come on, everybody remembers Pac-Man, right? Brad Paisley sings about it always wanting to go down to the, him always wanting to go down to the video arcade to play Pac-Man, and now we've got it on our phones, right? The sale of color TVs broke even with the black and white TV set in 72. And finally, in 1972, we had the debut of the greatest TV comedy of the time, MASH. How many remember what MASH stands for? Mono uh, the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And oh, just a final reminder of how things have changed. The average cost of a car, $2,500, rounding up. The average cost of a house, $27,000, and now we can say we can't get it unless it's 348K. And the average mortgage rate, now some things change and some things don't, because we're now we're back at 7.4 almost at this point. And then the average cost of medical school, don't even tell anybody here that's in administration, but $800, 
And I was an out-of-towner, having been, lived in El Paso, Texas, before I went back to where I was born in Baltimore. So I paid $1,600, but hey, I think I should not be complaining, right? <laughs> <laughs> so getting to what we're here about, I'm really happy to be here today to tell you about the AMA's Health Equity Center. History is important here as well as we talk about the center's historical background, its creation, and the evolution and achievements to date, and its plans for the future. The Center for Health Equity, CHE, or we call it the center, their leadership routinely uses this land and labor acknowledgement at the beginning of speaking engagements or presentations. It's a year-round acknowledgement that is very appropriate in this month of Indigenous People Day. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is most striking and inhumane. We know this quote from Martin Luther King, and health equity is why we're here. As well, Winston Churchill often quoted as saying, those who don't learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. And I like this caption posted in a schoolroom, probably a history teacher's classroom. It's an admonishment to his students that reads, in this great future, we cannot forget the past. Recognizing the importance of history, I'd like to do a little walk down memory lane as we address the structural barriers that contribute to health inequities and the major gaps in health outcomes in our nation. It's because of this history that accelerating AMA's mission around health equity has become imperative. I draw your attention to the 1947 records of the President's Committee on Civil Rights that was appointed by President Truman in 1946. The work of the committee points out the atrocities suffered by groups that are marginalized and minoritized in our country. And when speaking of marginalized communities, I include women, LGBTQ, people with, people with mobility disabilities, the international medical graduates, and groups minoritized that could in include black, indigenous, tribal nations, Latinx, Asian, and other people of color. And this report was a precursor to the 1964 Civil Rights Act that points out inequities in policing, the armed forces, education, housing, health services, and transportation. And it glaringly spells out all the separate but equal failures. But yet, from 1947 to 1964, there were no actions taken on the information that Truman's commissioned report laid out. Not until 17 years later did we get the Voting Rights Act passed to address that inequity in voting. And the next year, President Johnson signed the 1965 Medicare Act into law at the Truman Presidential Library here. So appropriate to be here. Which I think he did it there, personally, just for effect. Passing the Medicare Act was the first step towards getting health care to minoritized and marginalized communities. An effort, by the way, that was championed in 1965 by the National Medical Association, while it was opposed by AMA leadership at the time. Nevertheless, 37 years later, even with the passage of the 1965 Medicare Act in 2002, it was obvious that major gaps in health care remained and had not improved. For that reason, Congress commissioned the Institute of Medicine to study the health disparities. Importantly, that group was commissioned and was led by a past AMA president, Dr. David Allen, Dr. Allen Nelson, and they produced a document titled Unequal Treatment. The 2003 Unequal Treatment document found that even when correcting for insurance and income, Black patients received less quality care than white patients, and more often the black patients' amputations of limbs were, occurred be, versus revascularization and wound care. This was denial, of, there was also denial of pain and the expectation of a greater pain tolerance in black versus 
white young people. It was on the heels of the unequal treatment document that was released that the AMA, NMA, and the National Hispanic Medical Association created in 2004 the Commission to End Health Disparities. And for 12 years, the commission met three to four times a year in locations across the nation, spreading the word about this data. At the same time, our House of Delegates of the AMA passed policy of being culturally aware, the need to increase the pipeline for minority physicians, and the need to focus attention on chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, renal failure, and hypertension. However, without the ability to maintain its function financially, the commission was sunset at the AMA in 2016, and its educational activities were essentially relegated to the minority affairs section of our AMA. But this relegation, mind you, was without funding. That's the way things go, isn't it, right? And we know that what happens in an unfunded mandate, right? Nothing. The next year, and no doubt spurred by the results of the 2016 presidential election, members of the Minority Affairs Section and the Medical Society of New York submitted a resolution to reactivate the commission. I and other board members of the AMA implored the delegates to refer the resolution to the board for action and funding. I was very happy that then chairman of the board, Dr. Jerry Harmon, now in our immediate past AMA president, asked me to chair the task force on health equity. And the task force recommendations were three. To define health equity as optimal health for all, and to create an AMA center on health equity, and to annually provide a report on the progress of such center. And in 2018, the House of Delegates accepted the task force recommendation creating the Center for Health Equity. And in 2019, after a nationwide search, the AMA brought on Dr. Aletha Maybank, who has been building the center for the past three and a half years. Before we delve into the work of the center, it's always helpful to be sure that we're all on the same page with respect to terms and definitions. This is a basic slide with equity-related terminology. Diversity refers to the identities that we carry. The dimensions of diversity include, but not limited to, race, gender, sexual orientation, class, age, country of origin, education, religion, geography, physical, or cognitive abilities. And valuing diversity means recognizing the differences between people and acknowledging that these differences are assets. And striving for diverse representation is a critical step towards equity. To say, I don't see color, or I didn't notice your wheelchair, or your southern accent, is to deny who that person is, their experiences, and what they bring to the equity conversation. We must honor each other. Inclusion refers to how our, how our defining identities are accepted in the circles that we navigate. Belonging involves, evolves from inclusion, and it refers to the extent to which individuals feel that they can be their authentic selves and can fully participate in the life of an enterprise. And equity, it uplifts diversity and inclusion and provides norms and policies that ensure everyone has optimal health. Equity is distinct from equality. And while equality means providing the same to all, equity entails recognizing that we do not all start at the same place. I particularly like this photo because it clearly depicts the distinction between equity and equality. And I always say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Noun is a good time for me to then take a little station identification, as they used to say in the 50s and 60s. Who is the AMA? 
For 175 years, the AMA has been rising to the challenges in medicine by advancing science and research and physician training and CME and improving public health and building consensus around the common, sets, common set of ethics. Since our founding in 1847, the AMA has been the physician's powerful ally in patient care, and our mission remains to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. <coughs> AMA represents physicians with a united voice to government and other stakeholders across medicine, and we're delivering on our mission via three strategic objectives. Working to remove obstacles that interfere with patient care, leading the charge on chronic disease and public health crises, and by driving the future of medicine through innovation and improved physician training and education. Our AMA's House of Delegates is comprised of more than 190 state and specialty medical societies and other critical stakeholders. And this is the AMA's policy-making body. And our policies adopted by the AMA's House underpin our advocacy efforts at the state and federal level, as well as we influence medical practices for millions of physicians in the US and around the world. To fulfill the AMA's mission requires us to use our resources of influence and power to push towards a more equitable future. And I like this slide because it shows how equity, along with innovation and advocacy, works throughout the mission of our AMA. It's not a separate entity, but it's an accelerator in achieving AMA's goals. That said, the work of the Center for Health Equity is not siloed within the AMA. It is part of every business unit, our education, our membership, our science, and engagement. We know that access to quality health care is only one aspect of living a healthy life. Research at the Kaiser Family Foundation and others identify a number of social determinants that may impact a person's health and well-being, such as socioeconomic status, education, mobility, employment opportunities, transportation, infrastructure, and other overall environmental qualities, as well as genetic factors play a role. There are many systems and these are the systems that we have. There are many systems and discriminatory, I'm sorry, and discriminatory sec structures that create and maintain health inequities for historically oppressed individuals and communities. This is just unacceptable and avoidable. Without system level and structural changes, health inequities will persist and marginalized communities will be disproportionately impacted and the health of our nation will continue to suffer. And that's why the AMA's Center for Health Equity is so important. We name and call out systems and structures that cause harm by continuous inequities and we seek to inspire groups to work together to dismantle the barriers that disadvantage our most vulnerable populations. So how do we do this? We show them how doing anything less actually impacts all of us. The health of the nation or even the world is at stake. And I commend to you a New York bestseller, The Sum of Us, by Heather McGee. AMA had her at our November 2021 virtual plenary session. She held an inspiring discussion with our current AMA president, Dr. Resnick. And I think that this excerpt from the book's introductory comments can give you a sense of how equity is better for all of us. It says, and I quote, McGee finds proof of what she calls the solidarity dividend, the benefits that we gain when people come together across race to accomplish what we simply can't do on our own. With startling empathy, this message leaves us with a new vision for a future in which we finally realize that life can be more than a zero-sum game. As a reminder, Dr. Maybank started at AMA just months before we were hit with the COVID shutdown of March 2020. 
But the need, the importance, the urgency of the work that the center has done did not stop because of isolation. Indeed, it accelerated. During COVID, the disparities in affected minority communities, elderly and susceptible frontline workers were noted and the center pushed the CDC and HHS to acknowledge this and to disseminate the data to assist the health community to take action. At our AMA special virtual meeting of the House of Delegates in June of 2020, with COVID at its worst and right after the George Floyd death, our leadership pledged to take action on racism in healthcare and society. And our House of Delegates put forward and passed multiple health equity resolutions that are now AMA policy. And some of those policies include recognizing that racism is an urgent threat to public health, and we denounce police brutality and all forms of racially motivated violence. As well, AMA policy recognized that physical and verbal violence between law enforcers and the public, particularly prominent in black and brown communities, is a critical determinant of health. After both House of Delegates meetings in June and November of 2020 and passage of these AMA equity policies, there were media tours about AMA stance on these issues. We had requests from TV, radio, print, and social media. And of course, this is me with the right reverend, Al Sharpton, on MSNBC. And he knows me from the Sickle Cell Association, the NAACP, and as past president of the NMA. And I think he might have done a double take when I told him I was addressing AMA stand on racism as a public health threat. But we definitely passed the message on to the public. The AMA's plan to, uh, this past fall in this fall of 2020, rather, that, that fall in the fall, uh, that year in the fall of 2020, that was what we did with the media tour. Then in the spring of 2021, the AMA Center released its plan for embedding racial justice and advancing health equity. It's an ambitious multi-year strategic plan to carry out our work. The plan calls on physicians to help address determinants of health by dismantling the structural and social drivers of health inequities. The plan outlines five strategic objectives to begin tackling these challenges, embedding equity and racial justice throughout the AMA, building alliances with marginalized physicians and others, and ensuring equitable structures and opportunities in innovation, and pushing upstream to address all determinants of health and root causes of inequities. And lastly, fostering pathways for truth, racial healing, and reconciliation of our AMA's past. So how do we do this? We always say that charity begins at home. We embed equity and racial justice throughout the AMA by expanding our understanding and implementing an anti-racist equity strategy in our programming, in our policies, and our culture. We build alliances with marginalized physicians and other stakeholders by developing coalitions to elevate experiences, ideas, and concerns of historically marginalized and minoritized healthcare leaders. And we push upstream on the determinants of health that impact inequities by empowering and equipping physicians with the knowledge and the tools to tear down structural and social, structural and social drivers of inequity. And we ensure equitable structures and opportunities and innovation through the AMA's existing efforts to advance digital health. And lastly, but most certainly not least, we foster pathways for truth, racial healing, and reconciliation for AMA's past and the decisions of AMA leaders in the past that have contributed to many of the inequities that persist in medicine today. Here is where knowing our history meets up with making a commitment to change. It's a commitment that says our past will not be our future and that the future begins today. Moving towards truth, 
healing and reconciliation, AMA examined its history and current practices and saw steps that needed to be taken. And it's noted that after the Civil War, the AMA declined to embrace the policy of non-discrimination among its member organizations. And between 1970 and 1960, 1870 and 1960, AMA openly practiced racial exclusion in their memberships, which impacted black physicians' hospital privileges and the delivery of care to the community. The Flexner Report of 1910, commissioned by the AMA's Council on Medical Education, contributed to the closure of five out of seven black medical schools and all three women medical schools. The AMA was silent in debates over the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and would not support amending the Hill Burton's Act separate but equal provision, which allowed construction of, construction of segregated hospital facilities with federal funds. As part of our reconciliation, the late AMA past president, Ron Davis, with whom I had the pleasure of working. So I know that he pushed against the odds to issue an unequivocal apology to African American physicians, their families, and their patients at the 2008 NMA convention in Atlanta, Georgia, the birthplace, by the way, of the NMA in 1895. And it was also at that convention that I was elected to be president of our NMA at that time. As part of our reckoning with the past and to avoid repeating it, it is noted that Dr. Nathan Davis, often stated to be the father of our AMA, explicitly excluded women and black physicians from representation in our House of Delegates. Recognizing that, our current CEO and EVP, Dr. Madera, had the bust and display of Dr. Davis removed from public view and placed in our archives, where he says they will rightly serve as educational materials. And the AMA removed the name of Dr. Nathan Davis from an outstanding government service annual award that is given um, in February most times. Lastly, but not the final act, at AMA, it's not unusual for us to edit past policies. We've had policies on increase in minority students in medicine for years. However, AMA is finally recognizing the failures of the racist and sexist assessments made in the Flexner Report of 1910 and states it now in AMA policy. The policy enhancement reads, AMA is committed to promoting truth and reconciliation in medical education as it relates to improving equity and recognizes the harm caused by the Flexner Report to historically black medical schools and the diversity of the physician workforce and the outcomes of minoritized and marginalized patient po populations. The Center for Health Equity has not had an easy pass over the last few years. Leadership at AMA has received negative press, angry phone calls, and at times required home security. But there are more days of elation and bright smiles over our accomplishments than there are those dark moments. And I'm really proud to be here talking to you about the creation of the Center for Health Equity and talking about the equity policies that have been passed by our House of Delegates and the steps that our AMA has taken towards being an equity-focused organization and the equity uh, media exposure via the TV, radio, print, and social media. We can say with great pride that the world has heard and is taking note of what the AMA is doing in the space of health equity. This is Dr. Aletha Maybank, who heads our Health Equity Center. And of course, you recognize probably President Obama. And they were at an event just this month, and per her Twitter feed, at which she is speaking. And she also, the, photo the photographer caught her just as she was greeting the president. And in her tweet, you can see her surprise as she approached, because he said to her, oh, 
I know you. You have a big and hard job at the AMA. And then he thanked me for my efforts, and I managed to get no more real thoughtful words across. <laughs> yes, Dr. Maybank and the AMA, others outside the House of Medicine are watching how we address health equity now and for the future. We have recognized these past mistakes made by our AMA founders, who were men of their times, but the impact of those mistakes on care delivery in the Age of Enlightenment will, will take continuous work to reconcile, heal, and truly reach equity for all. To that end and beyond passing policy and advocating for change, the center endeavors um, are included in this list of activities. I'm not gonna read them, but I'm just gonna expound upon a couple of these just to broaden your understanding about their objectives and achievements. On the Medical Justice and Advocacy Fellowship Program, this is a historic partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine, Satcher's Leadership Institute. The inaugural fellowship was created to be a collaboration uh, or educational initiative to empower physicians to advocate and advance health equity for marginalized communities. Applications closed on March 31st of this year, and we had 193 applications for just 12 spots. And they were submitted from people from all over the states, 40 states in Washington, D.C. And interestingly enough, about 50% of the applicants didn't list AMA as one of their professional memberships. So it is and has been an opportunity to draw membership to AMA. We have 12 physicians from around the country who were chosen, and the program began with an intensive retreat in September. And a cohort of the group joined us at our June AMA meeting in Chicago, and they'll also share their final projects when we meet next month in November in Honolulu. It should be an inspiring educational session, one not to be missed, and I do believe it will be televised, streamed. This is a guide to language, narrative, and concepts. The team, the AMA teamed up with the Association of American Medical Colleges to create a toolkit for physicians and all healthcare workers that provides guidance on equity-focused, person-first language and why it matters. And I can tell you that the response from some individuals to this guide is showed it was really needed. Yeah. Oh, the language we heard. I'm not going to talk about that, though and Health Equity Resource Center of the AMA Ed Hub. Building on the AMA's work to reimagine medical education, the center is advancing health equity, CME opportunities that provides a greater understanding of the determinants and drivers of health. And we encourage you to go to edhub.ama-assn.org and enter Center for Health Equity for the latest information. October 2020 saw the formation and launch of the AMA External Equity and Innovation Advisory Group. It's comprised of 11 experts at the intersection of health equity and innovation. It's a diverse group, not just physicians, but we have entrepreneurs, investors, and advocates for health and well-being of historically marginalized and minoritized communities. It's a tremendous opportunity to inform the center and broaden the innovation work across the spectrum. I'll conclude leaving you with six ideas to help you drive your health equity work and mentioning a few good books to use for reference. These six ideas are writing past injustices. Review your organization's history, I'm sure you have already, and see what you can do to bend more towards equity. The AMA is an example with their apology that they made in 2008 to the National Medical Association. And we want to counter malignant negative health narratives. Let's, not, let's be above blaming the victim. Let's counter or address the system that is creating the barrier in equity, like housing and neighborhood safety, transportation, jobs, and access to health care. We want to work to remove the systemic barriers. Three, we want to center or focus marginalized voices as thought leaders in the movement. Seek them out value their knowledge and expertise of the thought leaders, and engage them and support their voices in the equity effort. I'll take a little example of engaging thought leaders would be what I call 
the women and the well analogy. An organization wanted to help the village women in Africa who walked daily about a mile up the road to get water from the stream for their household each day. And the organization built them a nearby well. And one day, the organization noticed that rarely did anyone use this centrally located, high-tech, newly installed, pristine well. And when asked why, the lady said they enjoyed the exercise, and they enjoyed walking and talking with their friends, and most importantly, they liked getting time away from their husbands. <laughs> Lesson learned is before you do something for the people, involve them first and find out what they really want and what they really need. Fourth, adopt an anti-racist intersectional approach. We must have an intersectional approach because inequities can overlap to advantage some and harm others. Five, we want to act upstream and place greater value in addressing the political, the structural, and the social changes uh, that are needed to produce, that, that have created inequities. And six, each time we point our finger, there are three pointing back at us. We must get our own house in order before proceeding to instruct others. And lastly, here are some great resources. You can take a picture if you like. I'm certain that you have many more resources than I have listed here. And I highly recommend these and more to help us truly recognize that we are all in this together. And we know, per the old adage, that we are stronger together. And I'll add one more quote for today from the great NBA basketball player, Michael Jordan. Some people want it to happen. Some wish it could happen. And others make it happen. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Questions? I have one. Uh, Dr. Edwards, I, I think you mentioned that with the establishment of the Center for Health Equity that they, uh, that one of the uh, directives was to ensure that they report regularly on, and so, and we've talked a little bit over the last couple of days about how to maybe teach healthcare disparities, but I, I wonder how does one measure um, health equity? Do we know, I mean, what do they include in that report? What do they, what, what kinds of things um, yeah. are tracked? Well, we've been in, we've been working with our health equity center for it's now three, going on four years, three, three years. Um, the team has been grown from being maybe four or five people initially, and Aletha May Bank has now gotten about 50 folks that are now involved, not all at AMA, but across the country as well. Um, and what I, th I think we've noticed is that we then have people wanting to show us what progress they're making, what's happening in their community, and what has been effective. And so I think that that's how you pass the, the baton on, make sure that other people say, well, this is what I'm doing. We have the resources available for them. And other folks show us how uh, health equity is different wherever they are, whether there's the, they're in the country or out in the, not in the city, that there's a need for more transportation or access or remote learning that can be done where they're able to uh, be able to have some consultation done if they're in a farm country as opposed to in a big city and being able to access. There are a lot of different ways that health equity can be um, shown, and it depends on the population. And I think I didn't, I missed your question. That, no, did I get the gist of it? Yeah, you okay. got the gist of it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, so I would argue that some of the biggest barriers with our equity and health uh, also stem from the way our medical education is uh, created. 
and how we create our medical classes and we create our curriculum. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Dr. Edwards, how you, what your vision for representation um, entails when it comes to do with equity. We know that patients tend to do better when their physicians look like them, exactly. speak like them, uh, eat the same food that they do. And so I would argue that some of the biggest challenges we face uh, are at the undergraduate and medical school uh, aspect of the way our medical system works. And I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on how we can really push for more representation as it pertains to professors and attendings that mm -hmm. are people of color and underrepresented. Amen, that's it. <laughs> that, I mean, basically that is it. The, the fact is that we've got to show folks that diversity makes a difference in the, the people that you attract to, uh, to medicine and that by having that diversity, then people feel more comfortable with, oh, you do understand me and you understand what obstacles I'm up against. And so the more diverse that we can have in terms of our medical schools and and even before medical schools, making sure that people recognize that we want to have them participate in this healthcare system and um, making these things available to, to uh, folks that don't necessarily have means, but we might have some other scholarships and opportunities that are there. Uh, and letting folks know that um, diversity is key to being able to make sure that we address all the needs of the populations that we serve. There's no question. You basically answered the question that I went, went around circles on answering. <laughs> yes. Diversity is key. Yes, sir. Um, hi. First of all, thank you for your time and coming here today. Uh, my question is um, a bit of an extension off the previous one in that um, I, I recall from one of your earlier slides that uh, it looks like the AMA notes that initiative to increase the number of underrepresented um, individuals in medicine, particularly in the K or at least the high school space and things like that. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, in, in your experience so far, whether through the AMA or elsewhere, have you seen um, examples in particular that you felt have more consistently demonstrated some successes in their communities towards increasing numbers, or are there any innovative approaches you're aware of now to try to kind of tackle that sort of same question? Yeah, when, as we were doing, uh, thank you for that question, as we were, um, when I wasn't on the board and doing other things that I'm doing, I was definitely in the House of Delegates and definitely very active with the um, Center for Health Equity uh, or with the AMA as we, before we became the Center for Health Equity, uh, we would go around to different medical schools and different cities uh, and talk to people about uh, getting their, their students involved in the health sciences. And um, everybody had something different to, to contribute, um, to help the, encourage the students. And we didn't just talk to the folks that got into medical school, because that's a little bit late, you know, when you want to try and diversify. We were going down, not just to high school, even recognizing that we need to start in grade school, um, eighth grades, and we were going to some of these locations. And sometimes, in, 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 in many cases, just them having someone come to the school and tell them that you can be a physician and we need you to be a physician is one thing that has encouraged a lot of the students to start thinking about that and some of the teachers then to help them in terms of moving the curriculum so that the students would know, oh, I can do that. I can be a doctor one day and be able to provide the care that my family has not been able to access up to now, whether they were in a rural area or in the inner city. Uh, it's the, the program has been remarkable in terms of being able to show people the path forward of the opportunities and the, um, the ways that they can access medical, medicine for their community. So it, it, it's got a lot of, a lot of uh, mileage so far, but it has so much more to do, so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Looking at the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. have you, you, you've been involved with so many different um, organizations, state, local, national level. Have you seen in the last 10 years, 20 years, more 
underrepresented uh, in medicine folks ascend to leadership levels in those organizations? Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't mean like the NMA, right. but, but the AMA at the, at, the, at, the, um, at the local and state medical societies. The answer is yes. The fact is that <clears throat> we passed the word around the commission was getting a lot of attention. A lot of folks were creating their own commission within their medical schools uh, in order to encourage more diversity among their membership. And then over the years, we have seen them come back in the House of Delegates. And many of them say that's how I got started, having been to one of the commission meetings that you had. And now with the Health Equity Center that we have, we can continue that legacy of what has happened before. Um, but now we have a lot more financial support to be able to do that. But yeah, I've, I've, um, I've seen people now come back and they're saying that their class where they were used to be only 10% of them had any diversity among them. Now classes are 60% more women, more um, people of color, um, and just more people who are also uh, coming from rural areas as opposed to a city area. And the, the services that you provide in a rural area are going to be distinctly different from what you are, have available to you sometimes in, in the city. So yeah, we've seen a lot more diversity in the classes. And we're very proud of the work that we're doing. But we also know that it's not something that just happens. And we've done it in um, the creation of the center in 2021 or 2022. In 2030, we're going to still need to be talking about making sure that we are addressing the diverse needs of our, of our country, no doubt. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a question. Thank you so much for your talk. And that important historical lens. Um, the, the AAP had their national meeting just a bit ago, and it was a surprising to learn that the mortality from firearms in the United States has now surpassed motor vehicle accidents. Do you have any comment about maybe the AMA moving forward on advocacy or public health policy towards that with their stance on firearms? We have a lot of policy at the AMA, I can tell you, every <laughs> year. <laughs> you might not be like... But to say to specifically, specific I, I yeah. don't know all of the policies on firearms, but it is very easily accessible online to, to talk about what, uh, what we're doing in terms of that specific area. Thank you. Uh -huh, sure. Any other questions for Dr. Edwards? Well, it's been a real pleasure for me to be here, and I truly appreciated this opportunity. And maybe in another couple of years, I'll be back again, potentially. We hope so. Thank you. Thank you.